Hello and welcome to Wisdom and Productivity, the podcast of Dr. Efraim Martinez. I am a principal in search of wisdom and have found productivity to be a great tool for success. Today I have the great and distinguished honor of having with me Justin Brown, who is the Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion in Downingtown Area School District in Pennsylvania. Justin Brown, who are you? Hi, good morning, and thank you for having me on. Uh, wonderful intro. My name is Justin Brown, as you stated, Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Uh, I'm a father. I'm a teacher. I'm an educator. I'm a friend. I'm a brother. I'm a son. Uh, I'm someone who's gone through experiences that I've learned from, and I'm trying to use those experiences to build a better tomorrow. Uh, being the change you want to see doesn't really help too much. You got to teach the change that you want to see. And each and every day, I'm trying to be the administrator that I wish that I had when I was in school. So concepts surrounding empathy, kindness, understanding, forgiveness, grace, um, learning that it's okay to grow when you were speaking from an uninformed place and being able to bring new information to people. And it's okay to change your mind and be able to support others who may be different from you. So those are my, uh, that's who I am. Beautiful. I love not only being the change, but you need to teach the change. Yes. I absolutely love that uh, approach. Thank you so much for sharing. So for the viewers and listeners of the show, can you walk us through your professional trajectory up to this point? Yes. So uh, each person in my family is a K-12 through teacher, so I thought that there was going to be some gloom and doom that I would go and be a K-12 through teacher, so I had vowed that I would never do that. So I went to school to become a psychologist. Um, I found out very quickly that I did not like psychology theory, and I ended up getting a communications degree. I loved being in front of the camera. I loved newspapers. I loved branding and advertising, so I thought that was what I was going to do. The more that I spent time with students and in student leadership while I was in my undergraduate degree um, at my alma mater, um, I figured out that I really liked student development theory. So going back to what I said I wasn't going to do, there's a key there, right? Um, so I went and got my master's in student affairs and higher education. And my first job was actually at a university called Westchester University of Pennsylvania. I worked there for 10 years in student affairs. So my job was to help students grow, develop, learn, figure out how they um, figure out their next step as young adults. And I thought I was going to hang out with college students for the entirety of my life. Um, I had been doing training all across the country um, with student affairs staff, uh, colleagues, faculty, employees. So I thought that's what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And then COVID hits. And all the colleges and universities around the country shut down. And uh, I looked around and there wasn't a student in sight. And I said, well, where are the students? And they said, um, well, the students are still in K through 12. And I went back and did the exact same thing I said I wasn't going to do. And now I work with K through 12 students. And I will probably work with K through 12 students for the rest of my life. I love working with students um, at that age level. They are really trying to um, figure out who they are, figure out their identity. What do they like? What makes them them? Uh, trying to incorporate their family values plus their uh, identity and trying to figure out what are their values and what about their origin and their traditions and who do they want to be in this world. So uh, having the luxury and privilege to be able to just come alongside them to be cheerleaders and supporters and advisors and say, you know, have you thought about this? And, you know, you could do a career in this. Or I've noticed that you've been really talented at this. Has anybody ever told you that you could do this as a career? Or I noticed that you did really well in, in this. Have you ever are you interested in doing this? You should get an internship in this. Just being able to click the light bulb on for some students who may not see themselves as we see them, as rock stars. Um, that's my educational background. And uh, throughout that time, um, I've continued to do trainings for individuals um, on implicit bias, crucial creators, conversations, bystander intervention, uh, true colors, trainings on dignity, belongingness in the classroom. Uh, primarily, that is what my job consists of while in the district is to be able to come alongside teachers who are amazing, by the way, 
um, not only in my district, but teachers across the country, just amazing individuals and just come alongside the already amazing work that they're doing, but to support them in the classroom and figure out how we can help them make those connections um, that they may be struggling with or helping principals to create those connections because our communities are changing. The needs of our communities are changing. The type of students that we have coming in are changing. And how do we make those cultural and, 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 and competency connections to be able to bridge the gap between our community, our families, and our students? Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, that, I want to try to peel that onion. Tell us what caught your attention of working at a higher in the higher ed uh, education system so when i went to school i went to a school called slippery rock university it's a real place we were a jeopardy question and um, <laughs> i found when i looked around i was the only chocolate chip in the milk i went to a predominantly white campus and in my community people are like you don't have to go there go to an hbcu and i had so many of them around here um, that I could have attended, uh, where I live, uh, Cheney University, the first ever HBCU, Lincoln University, the first ever to receive its charter. So there were so many options that I could have chose. Um, two hours south, you got Howard. So um, I got a full scholarship to Slippery Rock. And when I went there, what I found was that most of my interactions with some of the students, my colleagues, my classmates, I was the first ever person of color they ever spoke to, the first ever black person they saw, the first black friend that they had for a lot of individuals, not all of them, but for a lot, because they would tell me, they would say, hey, you know, I never, I, I didn't know this. Like, thank you for sharing this with me. Or, you know, I've only seen black people on TV. I mean, this is Pennsylvania, and this is maybe five hours in a different direction. And these are experiences that people told me. You know, I came from a high school that wasn't that diverse. You know, I never really had a conversation with someone who was different than me. Um, and through those experiences birthed a student group that I created called uh, Building Bridges, which essentially was a student-led program that engaged in activities, uh, engaged in icebreakers and role plays and social experiments that really got people to talk about some of these key concepts. Because you had even international students who have never integrated or ever spoke to people who were the predominant student at the school. So it gave the students a platform to be able to share background experiences, culture, language, food, music, traditions, dance, and be able to be like, hey, this is me, right? Uh, we started in a classroom, broke the fire code, start, got into a bigger hall, broke the fire code, got an auditorium, broke the fire code. And the last place, the biggest venue that they could hold us was in the alumni center, which held about 200 chairs for us to have all of our students in there to host these sessions. They happened every Tuesday. Um, and out of those sessions birthed uh, my, my company called Diversity Awareness Program, uh, which I had for a very long time, about 15 years. Um, and that's where I, I was traveling the world. And one day I was in uh, California. The next day I was in Texas. The next day I was in Florida, just doing training and having the same format, right? Because nobody wants to be in a place where they feel uncomfortable having a conversation. In fact, research and data shows us that people would engage in these conversations, these hot topic items, but can, they can recall a time where they did say something um, or they asked a question and it didn't land the right way. And people are like, oh, I'm offended or oh, you're a racist or oh, you're transphobic. And most people probably aren't. But sometimes that communication style is a little different. So it might land differently. And people will always recall that moment where people made them feel that way. And that's not how I conduct my trainings. That's not how I um, advise people to conduct trainings. Your trainings have to be soft landing spots for people to be willing to explore and engage and make mistakes. And if they do make mistakes, you don't hold people to that for the rest of their life. In fact, you give people the ability to learn and grow and you got to show grace, right? People are going to mess up. But normally, if you give grace to people, people will expound grace upon you. So you have to be able to be in that space. Um, and I followed that same format to be able to have these conversations and be able to train people. So I think that having the um, these experiences in my past really gave me the uh, skills and tools to be like, oh, I really like this. I really want to hone this. I want to master this. I want to make this my craft. I want to make this be my legacy. 
taking individuals who are normally on either side of any playing field and see where the connections are, see what uh, makes us more alike than different. See if I can get people to not just be, uh, to disagree, but not be disagreeable, right? Getting p individuals to be to be able to have a dialogue with each other and say, you know what, I don't 100% agree with you. In fact, I don't agree with you, but I can see where you're coming from. And when I make decisions, I'm going to always reflect back to this conversation and try to align it with what I'm thinking when I'm making decisions. When you have a lot of people that are coming together, it allows you as an educator to not make decisions in a vacuum. So when we make decisions in our district, we always make sure that we tap the exact individuals that it's going to directly connect and directly affect. So if we're making a policy about students, we need to bring students in about policy. If we're going to make a decision that's going to affect the community, we need to bring the community in. If we're going to make a decision that's going to affect teachers and curriculum and how things are going to be uh, played out throughout the school year, we need to shoulder tap teachers. No one wants to ha um, have decisions made in a vacuum. Um, and ultimately, uh, Dr. Martinez, if anybody can really think about what this work is, this work is really important because students will never remember what you told them, but they will always remember how you feel, how you made them feel. And people don't care how much you know until you know how much they care. As educators, we don't have the liberty to pick and choose which students we want to support and which students we don't want to support. We got to support all students, regardless of how they come to us. We're we're there to be supporters. We're there to be advisors, um, and got to know which hat to wear in any particular situation. You know, I've worn hat of supervisor, advisor, cheerleader, coach, support system, uh, counselor, friend father figure. You know, you got to know what hat to wear in a particular situation. You don't want to show up to a top hat situation where what you really needed was a fedora. Amen. Amen. I love this approach and I I, I can perceive the, the gradual uh, process of getting involved in this important work from being a university where you were one of the few into integrating people, into making it into a career, the higher education of educating. So when you transition from the higher ed world to a school district world, what lessons do you learn? What caught your attention? Because it's a different environment. What? It's oh a different God. clientele. Uh, what lessons do you learn? What should we? What should we know? Well, I'll tell you about some. I'll tell you about my first silly lesson. Uh, versus the serious lesson, because I also think it's important that as educators, we try not to take ourselves so seriously, right? Because students need us to show up as our authentic selves so that we can allow our students to show up as their authentic self. So Dr. Martinez, I hope this gives you a, a, a good laugh. So everybody in my family is a K-12 educator, as I said, including my wife. So she is also a teacher. So working in admin, she often humbles me to see, you know what? You're just like an admin. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm trying to be a different administrator. I want to be one that's hands on, that people feel comfortable and supported and go and talk to. I don't want to feel like I'm working in this isolated castle where people can't reach me. No, I want to be relatable and I want to be reachable. Uh, one of the first lessons I learned very quickly was um, when elementary students come up and try to give you a hug, you give them a hug back. Right. Because in college, universities, you don't touch students. You're like, oh, nope, that's not a thing. And I would go do presentations or read books to kids and try to get them excited about showing kindness and creating spaces that are inclusive. And I would do games and activities and icebreakers for kids just so they got to know their classmates and they would have so much fun. And when it was over, they would say, goodbye, Mr. Brown. And they would give me hugs and I would go, oh, and people are like, what, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm not touching the students. They're like, no, no, no. You can give the students a hug. That's fine. And I went home and I talked to my wife, who's a second grade teacher, and she said, Yes, you definitely give those babies a hug. She said, do you know that you embracing them with a hug might be the only act of kindness that a student ever receives? And, it, and for someone who has had all of this training, all of this education, all of these years, right, of student development theory, there were things that I missed. And that's what I try to get to tell other people. You can't take yourself too seriously. It doesn't matter how trained you are. There are things that you don't know that you don't know. And there are things that people can give you that might not be in your field or things that people can come alongside of you and say, hey, you need to recognize that. That is so different. And that was one of the most simple 
hanging, low hanging fruit that I didn't learn. And that even extends, right? So not even just showing that act of kindness. Some of our students are coming to school and you just saying hello to them. That might be the first positive interaction they had that day or that week. Uh, sometimes when you put uh, a fire in a student, like trying to encourage them and trying to give them words of wisdom, that might be the only instruction that an adult ever just poured into a student. Um, some of our students come to school and the meal they have for lunch is the first meal that they're going to have that day or might be the only meal that have there that day. I think as educators, we don't understand that student, even though we exist outside of this vacuum of school, so do our students, right? They're not all going home to the same experiences that we do. And there are educators that bring these things home with them, but there are also educators that don't bring this home with them. School is just a job. Sometimes it doesn't translate, right? Um, I met obviously not my district, but when I did trainings um, in some districts, I met a math teacher who said, you know, I'm not really doing well in my class. Like my kids really don't like my class. And I said, well, why? He said, well, they're always falling asleep. And I said, well, do you like math? He said, I love math. <laughs> I life. I love it. Everything is so great about math. And I could see he was so passionate about math, but that wasn't translating in the way that he was teaching. And that was a light bulb for him. So I try to create light bulb moments. I love when people create light bulb moments for me. Um, so some of the big lessons that I learned, um, I learned that students really need us to provide them with opportunities, right? I never want to be an educator that says, I feel this way, so you should feel this way. No, 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 no. We got to give our students problem solving skills and development as well as critical thinking. So I'll give you an example, um, and it's still going on in the country, but I, I think it's really a, an important example. So uh, book banning is a huge thing right now, and there are places across the country where people are banning books. Um, there was some talk about people who were really upset with the Ruby Bridges book, and people were saying, well, maybe you all should ban that book. It's not a good book. And instead of saying, well, you know, I don't think it should be banned, I said, well, that's interesting that we all think this way why don't we go to the source so we invited ruby bridges to our district mm -hmm. to our students and our students had a one-on-one -on -one interaction with ruby bridges wow. i didn't want to say no ruby Bridges is great you should listen to her because she's a real life historian often referred to as the daughter of the civil rights movement no why don't you have this experience for yourself uh there's a lot going on overseas right now on um, the war in in gaza and both sides want to still be heard and want to be listened to um you got you can't pick and choose what side you want to be on as an educator i got to support both sides of my students um so you have the students meet with each other right and what i found out was that both sides of the students were like yep i have cultural and religious ties to this area mr brown but like i'm cool with those students and it was so like mind-blowing that the students were like no 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 we're cool no everything's fine like we understand what implications this has overseas, but for our community, we're going to look out for each other, right? We're going to make sure that each other feels like we are wanted, that we belong. It doesn't matter what our lived background is, our lived experience, or how we choose to identify. We're going to look out for each other. And for me, if there's no issues that are in the school that are directly affecting the students, um, directly affecting their instruction, and if the students are saying, hey, Mr. Brown, we're good, right? That's good for me. Outside forces want to see people be divided. Outside groups that have their own agendas want to come in and do all these things. And for me, it's important for individuals to be able to have programming, to have events and initiatives that really allow people to connect. Um, we're, we're losing our Holocaust survivors due to age. I mean, COVID really took a lot of them out of here, but there are a few that are still living. Uh, we have a Holocaust survivor coming in our district tomorrow. What a wonderful way for students to be able to see history right in front of them, right? You have someone saying, no, I lived through this. This was my lived experience. Come and ask me questions. And the students will be able to directly interact with that survivor. Um, it, makes, it makes learning fun. Um, we live out in the Philadelphia area. Um, so a lot of our students and teachers and families are Philadelphia Eagles fans. So even for people that are like, I don't like these topics, they make me upset. Um, I feel very strongly about this and here's why. I try to get parents 
to understand and teachers to understand it's not about creating you know the next generations of students who think one way no no no, no. we're not here to indoctrinate if we were going to indoctrinate kids we would indoctrinate them to pee in the urinal correctly and not on the walls we would indoctrinate kids to show up to school each and every day not have attendance issues we would indoctrinate students to not skip class we would indoctrinate some of our young men um, to make sure they shower each and every day. Like these are some of the things we would indoctrinate our kids, not in their thought processes. So you got to be able to shoulder tap people who are going to have an impact. I can come to school each and every day and say, show kindness, show respect, and look out for your fellow classmates. For a lot of students, that'll land on them. One of the programs we did this year was with Brandon Graham from the Philadelphia Eagles, Philadelphia legend. And he came out and said, show respect, show kindness and look out for your other classmates and everybody was like oh yes what a concept yes and they <laughs> loved it because there's an equity issue here right unless you have a lot of money you're probably not going to go to a philadelphia eagles game because the, the tickets are very expensive so now someone that you never thought that you could see is now in your community and interacting with you and is saying the same things that your teachers are saying, that your principals are saying, that other educators are saying, that your parents are saying about con the concepts of kindness, respect, understanding, empathy, grace. All of these things now start to connect, right? So these lessons that I learned in K through 12 is you got to be able to provide opportunities for people to come to their own inclusion, to, to come to their own conclusions, right? Um, I'm not a director that says, hey, do do what I say. No, I want to model behavior that I want to see. If I'm going to tell teachers to make intentional relationships with students, then I got to get out of my office and go make intentional relationships with students. I often don't like emailing parents back. I'll call them, right? I want them to hear the sincerity in my voice. I want them to know that there is an actual person on this other side of the phone. And in fact, I will invite parents to come to my office and meet with me personally if there's an issue. I often use the phrase, I'm not a diva. Call me, email me, I'm available to you. Um, I live in this community just like you do. So when I'm not working, you might see me in a grocery store. You might see me at the cleaners. Um, you might see me at a uh, at Burger King, like you'll see me. And I'll see students, Dr. Martinez, when I'm out and about, like I'll be eating with my family at like Chick-fil-A or something, and a student will come up to me, hi, Mr. Brown, and come up and give me a big hug, and I will make sure that I have the best reaction. It is so good to see you. How's your weekend going? Is this your family? Hi. Those interactions are life-changing for families and students that sometimes view education as this very adversarial entity. It shouldn't be. We should be working alongside parents to support what they're doing at home, our, what we're doing is to help make the best student, best human being, to be able to go out into the real world and use the tools that we gave them to be successful. If our students are graduating, um, when they complete our courses, and they don't have a plan that includes entrepreneurship or employment or education or enlistment, those are the four E's. Those are any wonderful careers that someone can do, right? Those are secure plans. I don't care if you go to college. Have, have a trade. I don't care if you do a trade. Start a business. I don't care if you're starting a business. Go to the armed forces, right? Employment, education, enlistment, um, and education or entrepreneurship, right? The four E's. If our students leave our institution of K through 12 and they don't have a plan, we failed them. We did not set them up with the tools for success. We did not set them up to go out and be productive citizens in the world. And that's on us. So it's not about us putting all the responsibility on students. We got responsibilities too. We have promises that we need to be able to fulfill to have an impact in these students' life. And you got to watch your intent. Your intent is not about you. And I know a lot of people that come to work and think it's about them. It's not about you, right? And I say it to myself all the time. It's not about you. I don't care how the work gets done. Let's just make sure that it gets done. Imagine how much work we could get done if we didn't need the accolades or we didn't need the applause, right? Or I didn't, how much work we could get done if I didn't need the credit? How many things we could get done that would positively have an impact on students? So these are just some of the lessons I've learned. Wow. In well, definitely a light year jump and difference than being in uh, higher ed. 
Justin, what a master class. I think um, the, the way you have described diversity, equity, and inclusion is so positive. It's so about teaching kindness, about making people feel that they belong, that they are included, that observing real life examples of what they are learning in books uh, instead of like hearing all the noise that is uh, uh, putting things that is evil and we, are, we should not, you know, one of my favorite quotes um, from uh, a person I interviewed in the podcast was a professor at UIC, um, uh, David, his name, I cannot forget uh, his last name, but he said, since when historical accuracy became a threat. And I think that it's so important that we know what has happened so we can make our future better. And in the way that you describe it, it makes me feel why not every district has a director of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion, because we just make um, human beings be better so they can do better in life um, in, a, in a most just and fair and 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 kind society. Justin, yeah. thank you so much. I, I, I much appreciate your description. It really has opened my eyes on that emphasis on the eye of inclusion. And yeah. uh, usually people just stop in the first one. Um, thank you so much. So let's talk about, Justin, um, lessons learned. Uh, like in Back to the Future, if you could okay. go back to any position you have held in the past, uh, what will the adjusting of today tell the adjusting of back then? What would I tell my past self? Um, you know what? I would tell myself what I tell my students, but I would live by it and not just say it as a line. But anything that's for you is going to be for you. The stars um, will align. And you will always be in a place that you are always meant to be. Um, like a lot of our students can be really stressed about, well, what if I don't get an A in this course? And what if I don't pass? And what if I don't get into the school I'm supposed to? What if this major doesn't accept me? And yes, all of those things are possible. And those things are really, really um, strong realities for a lot of our students. But it should not be such a strong reality that it affects your mental health. And mental health in our teens is honestly being overlooked they are overly stressed they are overly medicated they are uh, uh, deprived of sleep because they are involved in so much i think society social media and families uh say more 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 and students are smart and they're not going to say oh no i'm not going to get more they will they are obliged to please and obliged to complete the goal so they will do more and more and more. They're not paying attention to their health. They're not paying attention to what they're eating. They're not paying attention to their body when their body's saying, no, slow down, take some mental time, turn the phone off, uh, take some time to rest, take some time to reflect, go do something that can turn your mind off, like uh, going for a run, um, listening to some music, reading a book. It's, you know, I think there's a big competition here i mean when students i mean adults do the same thing we look on social media and we see the next person who's thinner or the person that has all the cars well how come i don't have that you know well that person looks like they're living a better life than i am in fact these people on social media will say you know what you meant i'm making 10 million a year how come you are making 10 million a year here are the 10 steps and when you <laughs> see enough of those messages you can start to internalize them and feel like you're not good enough I have students tell me, well, you know, such and such celebrity, they do this. And I say, you know, that's not real, right? You know, social media is not a real place. Well, you know, my, you know, all of these students, did, I said, these students have the same insecurities and worries that you have. It's just that you're showing up, being authentic, being like, hey, here's my anxiety. Here are things I fear. Here are things that I'm worried about. And they're just not. That's the only difference. You don't know what your colleague is going through, but oftentimes, we compare ourselves, right? And then based on our comparison is how we make ourselves work, right? It's called self-esteem for a reason. And we don't spend enough time building students' self-esteem. We don't. So if you were saying, what would I tell myself? I would tell myself those same exact things, that 
you know, people are going to do this work very differently than you. I've seen people do this work and are completely like, nope, you need to look out for uh, systemic uh, issues that are happening and are very rough with people. And that's not really a way to connect with people. If I was to tell you how this work really should be uh, rolled out, the most fundamental aspect of doing this work, like if this work was built on one system of framework, it's making intentional relationships. If I'm looking at you from across the room, do I care about your dignity? Do I care about your integrity? Do I care if you're a human being? And one thing is, uh, Dr. Martinez, that's a skill that can't be taught. You either care about people or you don't care about people. I don't care all the training that I've done in my life for people. I mean, I've sold, I've sold thousands of seats over my 15 years of people doing doing trainings with me. I can't, I can't train you to be empathetic. I can't train you to care about your fellow man. It's a choice, either you do or you don't. People roll these concepts out differently. And I can't sit there and and be like, well, maybe I should be harder here. Or maybe I should be softer here. I have to do what's best for my community. And I can only know what's doing what's best for my community if I'm directly engaged with them, with them talking to parents, if I'm showing up. That show up aspect is so important. I don't just do work in DEI. Students invite me to dodgeball games, to plays, to concerts, to football football scrimmages, um, to their personal clubs and orgs. I don't care what, what it is. I just want to be in the space. I just want to show up. I want to be an administrator that I wish that I had when I was in school. There are kids graduating knowing that I was an administrator in the school. And, uh, and, don't, and people are like, how do you know these students? Administrators are not student-facing positions. They're not. Our work directly impacts students. But a lot of times when you talk to administrators, they don't know any student's name. And I love being in the community and knowing students by first name, knowing their families, knowing... You know, when we go to graduation in two weeks, that when these students are walking across the stage, a lot of them, I know who they are personally. Um, so that's what I would say. I would I would go back in time and tell yourself that it's going to be okay. You're going to align. You don't have to compare with anybody. Be uniquely yourself. Allow people to uh, take time to reflect on their self-worth, their mental health, and really try to understand that there are some things that are out of your control. Right. Like I said, I can't teach people empathy. I also can't um, look at who I am based on how someone else feels about me. Right. That's a reflection of them. It's not a reflection of me. There is no amount of kindness, understanding, uh, kind gestures or positive affirmations that you can give somebody that is going to change their mind about you who has already made up in their mind that they're not going to like you. It's OK. Continue to move forward. Beautiful. Great lesson. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I'm sorry, Justin. Justin, oh, let's talk about books. Okay. As you know, reading is a luxury. Uh, yes. If you will have to give two of the most important books for you, for a loved one, one fiction and one nonfiction, which books will those be and why? Oh, man. Um, man, that's hard. That's, re that's a really hard question. Um, and it hits home because our country um, is going through a literacy crisis. I don't know if people are paying attention. They are just moving students along. Um, and our students, a lot of them are graduating and don't know how to read. Um, not in our district. Oh, I hope not in our district, but I'm, I'm, I mean, I don't have any data that supports that that's happening. But across the country, there's data that's showing that people are... are there we have students sixth to eighth grade and they are reading on a kindergarten level so reading is certainly fundamental um the autobiography of frederick Douglass is a must is a must um and it's a must because his legacy is so important to what we are doing today especially for me so um I identify as a black man. That's who I am. Surprise. You know, there are people who are like, oh, I don't see you as a black man. I, I just, you know, I don't, I don't, I see, don't color. see color. I, I don't see color. And I laugh and I say, you know, I will never drive in a car with you. And they're like, why? And I was like, because what would you do when you come to a traffic stop? Like, of course you see color. I'm okay that you see me as a black man. I show up with black male experiences. That's why diversity is so rich. 
Um, not everything about my work is about being a black man, though, right? It's only a piece of my story. You know, I often tell people, like the movie Shrek, I'm like an onion. I've got layers, all right? That's my intersectionality. Um, but his book often reminds me that about 100 years ago, the things that I'm doing right now were never possible. It wasn't impossible to have black educators. In fact, it wasn't even possible for me to be in that same school. In fact, it wasn't even possible for me. And, you know, I told you I went to a whole bunch of universities. I'm wearing a university uh, right now, Bucknell University. Uh, I've, all my all my wardrobe is all universities that gave me swag for coming to do training. Um, but I couldn't even go to the same universities, right? I opened up the show saying that I went to a predominantly white school, um, but I could have had a choice to go to an HBCU. The fact and the privilege of choice, right? When I was in school, I had a choice of where I went. It wasn't like the only option, right? He talks about all of these things that he could not do, and he still was able to persevere and still be able to accomplish things at the highest level. In fact, the last speech that he gave was at Westchester University. They actually have a statue in the exact same place where he stood and gave his last speech in Pennsylvania. Um, he was an abolitionist you know there's there's no need for abolitionists today but there's definitely a need for educators there's definitely a need for people who are teaching about equality and equity there's definitely a need for people to teach about belongingness and caring and kindness and understanding and cultural competencies and culturally sustaining education and culturally responsive work i mean what Frederick Douglass went through to where we are now are leaps and bounds different of difference of each other. But it is a good reminder that we often show up in spaces where people don't necessarily want us, but our voice is so important. Um, I wholeheartedly know that there are spaces that I show up in where they want a black face, but not a black voice. But I got to be able to bring all aspects of myself into the conversation, whether right or wrong. I'm, I never profess to be right about every single thing. I just want to give you an insight and a glimpse so that you can't look back and say, well, no one ever told me. Or I don't know anybody who has this viewpoint. All right. I don't know why this happened. And a lot of times people don't want to admit that they're speaking from a place previously where they were uninformed. Right. It's OK to make mistakes. It's OK to change your mind. It's OK to say, you know what? I was speaking from an uninformed place last time, and I've learned a little bit, and I've kind of changed what I thought about about it. And thank and thank you for helping me with that. Thank you for showing me something that I didn't know. It's iron sharpens iron, just makes us better. Uh, a book that um, is fictional. I don't know a book that's fictional. I don't know. I don't think my favorite book has been written yet. Right? There's a lot of. Uh, mm -hmm. Fict fictional books that are out there. Um, I've written a few books myself. My wife and I um, actually wrote a few children's books uh, based on our daughter because she was saying, you know, none of these kids look like me in my book. So maybe my maybe my book with my daughter is is probably my favorite fictional book, only because our daughter helped us write these, and you know, we were able to do them as a family. So we have full series. So maybe I would say that was my was my favorite fictional. Tell us about your book. What, what should we know? Yeah. So uh, my daughter's name is August. Uh, very inquisitive child. Um, when she was younger, she's now nine. Um, so she's about she's like in that preteen phase. So you're like, oh gosh, here it comes. Uh, but when we were she was little, she would like say like read books to me. So we would read the common books that people read. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. We would read. Um, if you give a mouse a cookie, you know, all of those, you know, staple books that you read to kids, you know, um, she would look at the characters and say, oh, those characters don't look like me. And again, this was what, eight years ago, um, you can find multicultural books everywhere now, but, back, but, but when she was a child, you couldn't And think about that, like a 10 year leap, how quickly the landscape has changed for books. So my wife is an elementary school teacher. She said, oh, you wrote so many books. Have you ever thought about doing a children's book? And I was like, no. And she was like, I would love to write a children's book. So we found an author, an amazing author, I mean, amazing uh, illustrator who took pictures of our family and said, uh, I can totally make a book about your family. 
And so we wrote the we wrote the words and we looked at some of the panels and she said, you know, this is a great story. I'm going to try to illustrate this for you. And we started making books based on this little girl that looked just like my daughter and um, the misadventures that she would have. But then, you know, one of the books we were like, well, we really want them to learn about some core concepts. So when I go to talk about diversity, I talk about, you know, September Lear Rose learns how to be kind. What do you mean, learn how to be kind? Either, either you're kind or you're not kind. You'd be surprised at the amount of people who actually have to be taught the practical uh, applications of kindness, right? You say hi when we see people. You acknowledge people. If you see someone that's sitting by themselves, you ask them to join. Um, you say, excuse me. You say, thank you. Uh, when someone does a good job, even if you lose, you show good sportsmanship. Um, if it's someone that's in those space and you don't know uh, enough about them, you can say, hey, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about that? I'm, I'm uninformed about that. I would love to learn about that. These concepts are hard for adults. Like <laughs> adults are sometimes have a hard time showing kindness. I just think everybody's just so angry at each other. I feel yes. like just shut the world down for two days. Let everybody take a recess, right? Recess usually ends in K through 12 around fifth or sixth grade. I think some adults need a recess, right? Just take a recess. Go out. Don't worry about what side of the aisle you're on. Don't worry about what bills you have to pay. Don't worry about all these things. And that's a luxury for me to say that. Some people, and a, and a privilege, some people don't have the ability to take a recess. But if we had the ability to just shut the world down, take a recess, everybody just take two seconds. Let's regroup. Let's rethink. Let's take a step back. Let's reflect and to figure out how we're going to work together because we, the world's not changing, right? We have to do that. I said be the change. Uh, I said teach the change instead of be the change. Because I don't think being the change works. And I know that because I'm an aggressive driver, right? If I come to a four-way and I get there first, right? There are times that I allow people who I know did not get there before me to go. And I'll go like this. And what's the kind thing to do if someone lets you go? You wave. Say thanks. There are people that don't wave. My kindness did not change who that person was. But if I teach somebody, hey, someone if, if you know you or you weren't sure about getting in the four-way and someone lets you go or they're going like this and they're being kind, go ahead and take it. Don't be like, oh, no, no, you take it. Go ahead and take it. Give them a wave. Tell them thank you and keep with it, right? A lot of concepts, not even just about the road, how we interact with each other in our neighborhoods, on our jobs, in uh, public spaces, at venues, at sporting events. You know, all of these things could be more positive if we just taught people, hey, listen, here's how we conduct ourselves so we have a better positive society. Um, it, and it's funny. I, I'll give you one example about this. It's, it's really funny how kids pick up things, right? So I told you, Philadelphia area, um, I took my family to a Flyers game. We don't, we don't do hockey. We're not hockey fans, but we had the ability to go to a Flyers game. And I remember they were pay, playing the Pittsburgh Penguins. And the, there was the whole stadium is obviously flyers. So it's orange, white, and, and black. And I remember there was a, a Pittsburgh Penguins fan right in front of us. And I started talking to him. I was like, hey, what's up, man? Like, are you from Pittsburgh? Like, I'm just talking to him. And I wholeheartedly remember my daughter saying to my wife, why is dad talking to that Penguins fan, right? There was a piece of my heart that was so proud, like, yeah. But then there was a piece of me that was like, there's nothing wrong with this person. He's just cheering on another team, right? He likes hockey just like we like hockey. He came to enjoy this team just like he enjoyed this team. And my wife and I had a laugh because I do that. If I'm watching football, I do that to Cowboys fans. And, you know, how do children, how do they pick up on these small things that we do? Even though it's silly and it's in good sportsmanship and kind of fun, maybe some of those concepts really do take people to another place where it no longer becomes good sportsmanship and fun, but it becomes how they really feel. Those people are different than us, so we treat them different. We don't speak to those people. We don't integrate with those people. We don't allow those people in our schools. We don't want those people in our neighborhood. We don't want those people on the job. We don't want to connect with those people. And I had to have that conversation. Hey, listen, like it's all good and fun. Have have fun with it, but don't take it too seriously. It's just a game, right? Some of these things aren't just games. They're real life for some people. So, hey, man, thank you so much. There's so much there. Uh, I think uh, um, <clears throat> when I think about uh, Frederick Douglass, you know, in many ways, he was the, 
the first director of DEI to Abraham Lincoln when he was thinking, because um, we think about Lincoln about, oh, he just abolished slavery, right? But I, yeah. I, tell, I tell my children, well, but he didn't really think they should have equal rights, even though he went at them. And Frederick Douglass was that figure informing uh, Abraham Lincoln and the opportunities that he had and how that uh, legacy has continued, right? Yeah. Through all the important mm -hmm. figures, Martin Luther King, Reverend Jackson, you know, and now people like Justin Brown working in districts, informing yeah. and advising on how to do this important work that continues being important because there's still impediments to have a complete uh, uh, society that is free of, of poverty, that is uh, free yeah. of, of uh, lack of opportunities, etc. Yeah. And and what a beautiful thing that you and your wife did for your daughter of writing a book uh, where not only she will feel included, but she is the main author. And what a great lesson that in life, uh, often the story is the one that you want to write. Right. right? Uh, either you write it or somebody else was going to write it for you. That's quoting Brené Brene Brown. Uh, what a beautiful oh, story. Love Brown. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you, Justin. I appreciate it. Uh, let's take a quick pause to celebrate the Teach Better community. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. Explore more podcasts at www.teachbetterpodcastnetwork.com. Now let's get back to the episode. So, <clears throat> Justin, who is or who are your biggest influences? My biggest influences. Um, I don't have anybody who's super big. However, I do love Brene Brown. Oh, my gosh. All of her concepts of connection, intentional relationships. I mean, everything that I learned about the processes of empathy, I learned from her. Um, I've never been able to meet her. Um, she's often very busy. She's usually on sabbatical doing some type of research as she should. Um, but she has, I mean, the concepts that she teaches are DEI related, even though she's not saying DEI, like there are people that are saying, I hate DEI, but all the concepts <laughs> about DEI, they're exact same things you're saying. What student was, doesn't want to belong? What student doesn't want to have, feel safe? What student doesn't want to feel included? What student doesn't want to experience kindness and understanding and respect, right? Um, I would say my biggest influences are probably individuals in my family because they all have very strong gifts that I've learned to be better from. Um, my wife has been a K through 12 educator for about 11 years and I've learned so much from her. You know, we try not to talk shop at home, but it's hard because she gives me a really good reflection of what I could be versus what is actually there. And I learned things about administrators that I'm like, I don't want to be that. So I'm actively going against the grain to not be those things um, and giving me an inside look of how teachers may feel about things. So before we make decisions, we got to make sure we're shoulder tapping our teachers. They are irreplaceable. Those teachers and medical professionals right now are on front lines dealing with things they never thought they would have thought of. We're going through a teacher shortage in the entire country. There's a lot going on. We need teachers. We need teachers more than anybody. And more importantly, we got to build pipelines to allow our students to think of teaching as a profession, right? Because they're also seeing how their teachers are treated. And they're like, I don't want to go into that position, uh, that profession, to be paid less and to get the type of ridicule they do. No, not for me. So we got we got to do better there. Um, I would say my father, my mother, you know, all the, all K through 12 teachers, right? There, there, it seems like there's a pattern here, um, of just who influences me and where I get my influences from, um, a man of faith. So I get my influences from, uh, God, particularly Jesus Christ. So I think that, you know, um, he hung out with people that didn't like him either. So, uh, for me, just trying to. Uh, be the best person I can be and show up and just be relatable each and every day. I mean, those influences. I mean, I think the students influence us too. Um, we don't want to let them down. I never want them to look at Mr. Brown and say, Mr. Brown hurt my feelings or Mr. Brown, you really let me down this day. I always, as Mr. Brown, want to deliver, 
right? Whether that's deliver on an experience, deliver on uh, a program, an initiative, a, an event, a celebration, physically showing up, being there as positive support. Um, students definitely shape um, how I think and how I show up and definitely influence me. So I think those will be all of those answers. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. I appreciate that. Um, let's talk about imposter syndrome. Um, uh, yeah. I'm sure at some point uh, you and everybody else has felt like, oh, I'm not sure if I'm good enough or I'm not sure if I can do this or why. How, how do you uh, address uh, that issue? Yeah. Um, as confident as I sound, I, I definitely go through imposter syndrome, um, particularly when this job first started. So this is my fourth year as a director of diversity, equity, inclusion. All of these positions sort of popped up when the country had its racial awakening after the murder of George Floyd. So a lot of people were put in these positions, even though they had training, they didn't know how they were going to carry out the work. I think how you carry out the work is more important than what you were trained in, right? Mm -hmm. And mine is experiential learning. I don't want you to be kind because I told you to be kind. I want you to be kind because you went and explored what kindness truly can bring and how it can connect us. I don't want you to be empathetic because I told you to be empathetic. I want you to go test out empathy and see if people are empathetic to you if you were showing empathy to others. Um, we were having meetings that were very public, you know, as most school districts do, and people weren't too happy. And let me tell you, uh, people did not give me a very kind welcoming. Uh, it hurt. It hurt the way that people were talking to me. It hurt the type of emails that I got, voicemails that were left for me. Um, at one point, I had to be escorted to my car a few times by security after certain, you know, board meetings. So that that was kind of hurtful. Um, and I felt imposter syndrome, like, well, maybe this isn't, maybe this isn't what I'm supposed to be doing. And maybe maybe this is um, this is different. But you know, you got to have strong convictions, which I did. And you got to stand 10 toes down. And what people say about you who don't know you is not a direct reflection of you. It's a direct reflection of them, right? And you have to be able to understand that you're having an impact that's going to positively affect people for the rest of their lives. I hope these lessons of grace, understanding, respect, knowing that there are other people who think differently than you. And guess what? Um, acceptance doesn't equal agreeance, right? I have friends who are Cowboys fans. I don't agree with that at all, but I can accept that they're Cowboys fans, right? Um, you gotta be able to be relational, not right. I feel like it's so important to be relational. You don't have to be right about everything. I'm not right about everything, but I'm not gonna degrade you and put you down and make you feel like you're less than, even though I we didn't decide on what I thought was the right course of, of direction. So, I think that imposter syndrome comes when you allow people's opinions and your insecurities to sit down for a cup of coffee. And I try not to do that. Um, I wouldn't take it. Uh, I wouldn't take criticism from someone I wouldn't go to for advice. So you really got to be able to put things in their place. And uh, just because someone says something about you doesn't make it true. And uh, what's more important is what you say about yourself what's more important is you working to be the best version of yourself and really trying to allow not allow those thoughts to creep into how you do your work and i don't i don't do that um if someone says something that hurt my feelings it hurt it for two seconds and then we're moving on right oh that wasn't a nice comment ah that hurt okay let me move forward and those are still the same people i say hi to whenever i see them out in public so it's like you know you just got to do what you got to do you got to keep moving forward and uh they don't they don't uh they don't get to tell you what your worth is you decide and you get to make a decision of what your worth is i i would like to think that i'm of worth i would like to think that i'm worthy so you know we continue, we continue to have uh impactful sessions with students and you and you keep moving forward beautiful especially in this world of social media where our children get so influenced by what they see yeah. and they define often their worth based on what they are seeing or or listening in a video or song i appreciate that thank you so much uh justin let's talk about uh productivity as you know uh being successful includes being on top of our productivity but this means different things for different people how do you get organized to ensure that all these beautiful things happen? Uh, how do I get organized to keep all these things in check? Uh, 
Well, people laugh at me and I don't care if you're watching this. I, I don't care. This is how I stay organized. Um, I have a hard copy agenda and schedule, right? It's color coded. I don't rely just on phone things, right? On phones. Um, there's a secret reason. And I will say this because I'm not ashamed of it. Um, if you strictly rely on this schedule that's on your phone, people can always hold you accountable to what they want you to do. So I'm like, oh, I need you to be a part of this. And I say, oh, I don't have my agenda on me. Let me get back to you about a time. Not like, oh, just check your calendar. See if you're free. Because if you're free, you have to commit to this right now. I don't want to live like that. Let me have a choice of whether or not I want to be a part of this or whether or not I can attend this. Um, so I think it's a good checks and balance. Um, but definitely making sure that you're planning uh, what's best for people, but not at your own detriment. I really try. I, I really try to make time for my family each and every night. Um, it's hard. There are times where mom is the biggest superhero. Um, I think she keeps me straight on what needs to be done and not done. But um, everything has a checks and balance. Who cares if you work this hard? There's no award for it. Hey, I worked 10 hours more than I was supposed to that day. There's no award for that. And time is the undefeated champion of the world. Once you once you lose it, you cannot get it back. It is not a renewable resource. So you have to use your time wisely. I felt like we used our time during this show very wisely. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, let's talk about email calendar. Uh, how does that look like uh, in your world? Uh, email calendar. I use Outlook, um, everything to a T. I know what my day is planned out to be and what it's not. Oftentimes that changes uh, when you work in a job like mine. Uh, you think everything is going to go well, and oop, a situation happened over here. Oop, a staff member said something, or oop, a student went and did something. So it's like it, it's up for grabs each and every day of how things look. I think if, if my counter went exactly 100% um, how it was supposed to, I'd probably look around at things a little bit weird. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, uh, to a T, you know, I tell people put things on my calendar. I'll tell people, hey, let's have a Zoom meeting. Let's throw a Zoom meeting up on the calendar. And uh, that's how I operate. Beautiful. And what about, do you have a to-do list uh, uh, yes. or how do you organize your projects? How yes. does that look? I have, well, I use the summer to plan. So administrators still work 12 years. And I, I think that's the most fun being in the laboratory and being like, okay, it's Hispanic Heritage Month in September. How many programs do we want to have? In my district, we have 16 schools. So I'm like, okay, what school wants to have this? And how do we do this celebration? How do we highlight this holiday? How do we look at important historical figures? So I really like being in the lab and like planning out what I'm doing. Um, I'm still a post-it note person. I will write things on a post-it note and stick it somewhere until I complete what I need to complete. Um, yeah, I think all of those things are important. But yeah, I keep everything in my agenda. That's how I that's how I knock things off. I'm a checklist. So person. are you a note taker? Uh, do. do you take notes in your device, uh, or do you just like how does it look like? No, I take I take notes and then I email them to all the people that were involved. So I say, hey, I just wanted to recap what we talked about today, so no one can say, oh, I don't remember, I don't remember when we said that. No, 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 check that email; it's there. I guarantee you, it's there. We talked about it. Um, documentation is so important because if you didn't document it, it didn't happen. I see. What? And if any, do you have any mindful activities uh, uh, that you do uh, in order to distress or health wise? Uh, what do you do? Health wise, I could be better. I think I'm on the run so much that I count that as running, but it's not. You have to intentionally make sure that you're doing time to, to exercise. Um, I enjoy a funny show. Uh, TV is probably my... Uh, funniest thing i like reruns of shows that you can just pick up wherever you're any favorite uh, uh shows that you watch i think how i met your mother is such a funny and creative show the way that they were able to tell a past present and future story and it all just lined up i don't like the last season like most people will probably tell you if you haven't seen it and i won't spoil it for you um I just think the writing was very intelligent. I feel like it was very lighthearted. I feel like there were episodes that were very serious. I think it's a coming of age of an adult. I think the characters are around the same age that I am right now. So it was like, I just think that no matter where you pick it up, it's just a funny show. Um, but um, I enjoy an occasional comedy. So I'll watch a movie that'll make me laugh. Something that was in the past, something that's in the future, just funny things. Um, but I think just spending time with family is a good time to really just regroup talk about how everybody's day is going um, i have another daughter too she's two year old so 
um, just being present. That that present piece is really, really important. So just taking time with family. And I think um, when you can eat the right things, try to. It's a lot of food that is just so good that is not good for you. So for sure. For it was sure. a balance. It was a balance. Awesome. And, and can we take a second to talk about the important topic of beards? I yes. admire that beard that you have oh, there. Oh, thank you. It's, I it's just a, recently shaved mine because I made an accident uh, and I greatly regret it. Uh, okay. Can you tell us about your trajectory with beards? Listen, and this one's actually shaved down a little bit. It, it, uh, you know, when I get my hair cut, when I get my hair cut in its full totality, I try to take it down just a little bit. Um, my beard journey probably started about a year ago. Um, it's a process. Like if you have, if you do not have facial hair, it's a process. You have to open up those pores and put the minerals in and the beard oil and consistently keep it moisturized and brushed. And you got to activate these follicles in your face and like keep it organized. It's it's a journey. Um, you see those ads online about beards and beard growth. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. And I can understand. Um, if I shaved it, I probably would look anywhere between five to seven years younger. I'd probably look like a little kid. <laughs> So my wife is calling me Jorge because she doesn't hilarious. recognize me. <laughs> that's hilarious. So I think that uh, I think I mean I personally feel this way. Other people might not feel this way. I think it gives you a, a, a certain level of prestige and authority when you have a beard. So I just try to make sure that I keep it nice, that it's not crazy or overtaking my life, but just big enough that people say, oh, I, you know, I like your beard. People often comment on it too. I think when you keep it nice people comment and say nice things about it. So it's been a journey. It's been a fun journey. I don't think I'll ever shave it. Um, and you know, Beautiful. It, it, yeah, it's not super brushy. I mean, we're doing this. If you're watching this, we're doing this early in the morning. So I, I still got a little bit of uh, maintenance to do on it before I start my day. But <laughs> I, I uh, you know, there's like a secret language when you enter into a place and you see a bearded person and they see you. And you are like kind of like a secret code, like yeah, yep. you're in the club. Yep. Uh, that's that's amazing. Um, I, I I really admire uh, the when you see someone with a very well kept beard, you know uh, how important is the dedication that it takes yeah. to get to that place. Take Absolutely beautiful, Justin. This has been such a great conversation. Any last thoughts for the listeners and viewers of the show? Uh, you're good enough. Uh, I think people are consistently trying to get to the next step, to be the next person, to get the next title, to get to the next goal. Uh, where you are in this current moment, you are enough, and that's good. You are great just the way you are. Wherever you are, you're supposed to be there at this given moment, at this given time. You are not here by accident. Um, take care of your mental health. Take care of your body. Take care of the people that care about you. Take care of yourself. Um I don't have, I think I gave a lot of like antidotes or an antidotes and, and gems throughout the show. So I don't have anything that's like the conclusion or best hitter, but man, we're just living in a time where like tomorrow's just not promised. And I just do not want to look back and be like, I spent all this time doing all of these things I didn't want to do instead of just living life, go live life. Like life is happening now. It's not happening when you get the next job or the next raise or the next title or the next whatever your life is happening now. Take advantage of life right now in front of you. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. And if life and if life is not beautiful, you just got to change where you're sitting, right? If you don't like the way it looks here, change your seat. That way, you're looking at life here. Change your seat so you're looking at life over here. It is. It can be beautiful. Life can be whatever you want to make it. And a lot of people are going through a lot of hard things, a lot of hard things. And I don't take away from those hardships that people have. Some people don't have the ability to say it's a beautiful day or say, I'm, I, I, you know, I can, I can make it better. Some people can't, um, but you got to make the best out of whatever it is that you have. Beautiful. There you go. Justin Brown, uh, such a pleasure and a luxury. Justin, have a great weekend. Hey, thank you. Thank you for listening to Wisdom and Productivity, the podcast of Dr. Epaim Martinez. Chulu. And I love that production. Chulu out.